Well, welcome to our another segment of the roundtable of Greentown Men's Breakfast. And I'm Ray Dorshuk, and we want to bring some topics that are questionable, topics that are that that everybody has an opinion on. But really, what does God say about that? And then, what does the Bible say? And what what do we feel as as solid Christians? What do we feel across the table of uh, about this topic? So our topic today is, is, is alcohol accepted in a born-again Christian's life? I'm not saying is alcohol accepted for the churchgoer, but is alcohol accepted for a, a person that says, I'm, I'm born again, I have the Spirit of God in me, is, is there a place for that in my life? And it, it, it's, it's confusing because our society is saying something much different than what really I think God is saying and what God's principles are trying to say. So we want to take this round table today and we want to, to dive into it and we want to challenge you to look at it, uh, how we look at it in the, in the, in the Bible and how we, how we feel uh, personally about this topic, about alcohol. Is it accepted? When I say alcohol, I, I think I have to put drugs in there. I think we have to put down other things like that. Anything that is is mind altering is what we want to talk about today, right, guys? Yeah. So right. I have Dave on yeah. my right. He can introduce himself. Like I said, I'm Ray Dorshuk. Welcome to the Round Table of Greentown Men's Breakfast. We are a Christian Men's Breakfast, uh, trying to tell men about how to follow Jesus as a man, not to look to the right or to the left, but what is the word saying for us? In the 2023, 2024, and so on, what what is the Bible saying? How we should operate our life that men might look up to us and not question us, but they would look up to us. So go ahead, Dave. Amen. My name is Dave Horner, and I've known Ray for quite a while, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited about talking about alcoholism because that was a big part of my life in my younger years, and mm -hmm. when I came to know Jesus. It uh, slowly became a less part of my life until uh, probably 42 years ago it became no part of my life. So I'm just here to join in a conversation yeah. and give my input. Great. Yeah. And I'm Stephen Grable. I'm glad to be here. I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Ray and Dave for a good few years here at the Men's Breakfast. It's been great to build our relationship and it's just great to be able to gather together and talk about these things. It's, uh, I know it's a sensitive topic for many people and uh, I know it is for me in part, um, but it's just, I think it's a very timely issue and it, it, it's just one of many that we're dealing with in our, in our culture and our society and so it's good to be able to kind of have a nice round table discussion and start getting into it and see where we can go and uh, I like your, your preface, uh, preface there about how, how does this affect someone who's a born-again Christian? What does that look like for us? It may look differently for others based upon personal convictions, but you know, what, what does the standard say? The scriptures, the Word of God, that's our standard that we Amen. need to constantly mm -hmm. bounce these ideas because the world's always changing, but, but God never changes and His Word is faithful. So that's what we need to measure everything we come, uh, everything we come up against to that standard and see how it how it measures up or if it doesn't so I'm glad to be able to be a part of this discussion so well, I think I think the first thing that we need to I think the the question is is alcohol for a Christian not for a Christian we're bombarded by our society and especially in the last year or two years our commercials on tv it shows people having fun when they're using a mind alterating drug and i don't think that's really totally true uh, uh you know they, they they put the the mind alterating drug with having fun well if your mind alterating drug if you can't remember it or you're not doing it in your right mind, is it really fun? But I don't think our TV today projects that. Am, am I right? Or You are right. You know? I also think, too, when it comes to um, 
looking at what the culture says versus what the uh, I'll, I'll use the terms biblical culture that we're that we as believers are wanting to hold our lives to and measure accordingly there almost has to be a, a, a clear line where wait a minute if I see how the culture is in, in a way redefining what drinking alcohol looks like and it, do I even want to have anything to do with that I mean uh, this looking at this one article here uh, it, it referred to a point in history where um, uh, where alcohol was more acceptable to drink because of uh, lack of pure water. <laughs> so I mean, at a time that it is, oh, well, well, let's drink a, sa a safer uh, drink uh, for the sake of health. But as a time and place for that, we have so many other alternatives. We have pure water, and there's no reason why we would try to use that as a justification. Like, well, I. I'm drinking for my health, you know, a glass of wine once a day and things like that. But like you're saying with the way the media is presenting on commercials, making it, they're presenting this wonderful lifestyle, making it look uh, fashionable. very fashionable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, in vogue. And in order to have a, a, an image, <laughs> I, have to, I have to partake in that type of lifestyle in order to build my image and my reputation yeah. because I want to be one of the life of, of the party and and that so there's an attraction to that culture that that's presented out there it just what's the appetite especially among the youth of today well, let me bring you back to the image because i think i think you hit it uh, our commercials are presenting the image of having fun with a mind alterating drug or drugs but as a christian our image is supposed to represent christ Yes. Our, our image, we're, we're supposed to be the reflection of Christ, not the image of what we, what man says is fashionable, is mm -hmm. what you're saying. I, I think what, what we need to come back to is our image should be of Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and then the image of Christ, maybe you want to hit on that, but then my next step is, is that, that, uh, that as we imitate the things of God, that's who we're supposed to be. Right. And I don't believe Jesus, when he walked the face of the earth, was intoxicated at all. And I don't, I don't believe that he drank. And it was even fashionable back in that day, I believe. Right. Um, and he turned, turned the water into wine, which yeah. everybody hits that one. But it doesn't say it was fermented. It could have been grape juice for all we know. But it's, the Bible talks about the quality of taste. It didn't talk about the kick of the taste, the kick of it, the mind-altering drug of it. It talked about the quality of taste, and I believe that God has a quality of life for you and for me, and He He did that as an example to save. You said that you saved the best for last, when He turned the water into wine. He saved the best for last because God has the best for you if you would accept yeah. Him this day, and from this day. To eternity, he saved the best for last. Amen. Right. The, the quality of it. The, it was the quality of the taste of it. It wasn't the ferment of it. And and there there's no scripture in there that says it was fermented. It wasn't fermented. Uh, you can debate that down the road all you want. But, um, but uh, it just... You can debate down the road all you want, but it's, sure. it's not it's not there. You have to make a, a conscious decision of how you're going to live your life and represent Christ. Yeah, I think that it's a good point about you know we're we're comparing our wine of today compared to what they had back then, which was you know grape juice or whatever that was more natural, and now we have all kinds of infused uh, liquors and. It's a higher uh, alcohol content than what they have, and it, it's a lot more, a lot more, a lot more to it than just what what they had back then. And uh, you know, in that the whole miracle, it, I believe there's a lot of uh, type in that. You know, when it comes to talking about what God has, changing water into wine. You know, there's a, there, it made me think of a scripture in Proverbs when it's referring to wisdom, um, which is. In Proverbs chapter 9, it talks about wisdom, referring to more of the church. Wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. 
She hath killed her beasts, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table. Talking about that mingling of wine and furnishing her table, it's like coming together in fellowship. Whether you're gathering with believers at a church service or enjoying a Bible study, kind of like we are, we're, we're mingling our wine. We're, we're sharing our testimonies, our experiences, our thoughts. We're, we're mingling our, our wine together and to see what God would, would do through us from our experiences and our thoughts here. But um, wine can be a, a beautiful thing in Scripture when people understand that it represents something more than just uh, a means of intoxication and manipulation, mind-altering. And, uh, but I think, I think there's, a, there's a time and a place for some of that, and that goes with the, the culture that they, they needed to have uh, an alternative for their drinking back then versus what we have now. But people are wanting alcohol as an alternative to fill a void in their life. It's, a, it's become a, a coping mechanism of sorts anymore in the, uh, a kind of uh, almost its own drug to, uh, to uh, drown out realities that people have to face. And it's a, it's a poor substitute for, for what we really need in our hearts. Right. Well, what Jesus says to cast all your cares on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, our commercials, if I go back to that, they're saying, uh, you know, if, if you're overwhelmed or whatever, take something to help you relax, take something to calm you down. Mm -hmm. That's the place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as God sent His Spirit here on earth to yeah. bring calmness mm -hmm. to, our, um, to our emotions, to our feelings, to our senses. Yeah. Uh, in the midst of a storm, God can come in, the Holy Spirit can come in and, and calm us. But we have to call on that name yes. Jesus and not call on a name that is going to, to help us to relax. Right. Um, so what do you think, Dave? Come on. Yeah, I, I think what Steve brought up in Proverbs was really good. And there's also another uh, scripture in Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 1, which says, Wine is a mocker, mm -hmm. strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And I can relate to that in my younger days before I came to know Christ. That was me. I was out there trying to get drunk. My purpose was to get drunk when I was drinking. And also in Ephesians 5.18 it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a lot better to be filled with the Holy Ghost than it is to be filled with liquor. Mm -hmm. Well, it says not, you know, you're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. Right. Can you be filled with both of them? Can you be filled with a mind alterating drug, and can you be filled with the Spirit of God? I would lean toward, my, from my perspective, that if a, if one is really filled with the Spirit, and all that that entails to be filled with the Spirit, that be a, a praying lifestyle, a devotion to walk with God, walk with the Lord, um, among His family that would drown out the need for and would almost condemn the believer as to I need to get help with this if it's an issue or let me not try to take two because you can't you can't serve two masters right. as Jesus says you know right. you got you can't serve God and mammon and mammon whether it be money drugs you name it anything in this life that people try to use as a as a filler for what what ultimately only God can provide talking about that and, and I really want to narrow or hone down on that can you be filled with the Spirit of God and can you be filled with a mind alterating drug because Jesus the Holy Spirit cannot it cannot be close to sin it can't it can't uh, it can't fellowship with uh, with unassuredness mm -hmm. uh, in, as born again Christians, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, He speaks to us at night when we're calm, when we're relaxed. Mm -hmm. That's part of the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. Yeah. 
and the Holy Spirit, if you choose to use a mind alterating drug, the Holy Spirit cannot, you, you made a decision, the Holy Spirit is not going to push his way into your decision because you're a free moral agent. Mm -hmm. So for a free moral agent, then we have to give place that our mind is clear uh, that the Holy Spirit can come in and speak to us. Um, you, you know, the, the house is divided, you know, mm -hmm. if, it, if it's on two different things and, and you're dividing your house, you're dividing uh, your, your spirituality with, with demonology and it, 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 won't, it won't jive, it won't go, it won't work. No. I believe that's right. Yeah. I think even if a person tries to do both, whether they're really a they're really a devout Christian, they're wanting to be committed. They they know in their heart of hearts that God is the only source of deliverance for this condition, and yet there's still that addiction that they have that they're struggling with. So they'll they'll be that storm that <laughs> that torrent in their heart. Knowing that they, they that there's something wrong that they've got to they've got to get it right, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying. They can't cohabitate because that drinking that problem opens them up for that mind altering, and that's where that's where the real emotional damage starts to happen if it's not if it's not left unchecked and dealt with. So, you know, when now we're starting to talk about something kind of exciting for me because when you're looking at someone with an addiction um, there's people out there that are Christians that have alcohol have drug addiction has uh, lust addictions sex addictions there's, there's Christians out there that have addictions with control control freaks uh, that, we're not trying to hit just one one thing here but uh, the thing is 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 we're supposed to come to God with a pure heart. Amen. Yes. Not an alternate, not an alterating heart, not a heart that uh, that is. To me, when we do a mind alterating drug, we put our mind on coast. Mm -hmm. Our mind is on coast, and that's a dangerous place to be because when our mind is on coast then we're allowing the devil to come in or demons to come in and they can tempt us, they can torment us, uh, they, they can attach themselves to us because we, we are no longer in uh, control of our, of our mindset or a mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we've put our, our mind out there on coast and, and we have some drug in us to, to totally relax us Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit won't come in because the Holy Spirit's a perfect gentleman. Right. But if our mind is on total relaxed point, the, the devil can come in. We opened ourselves up to demonology. We opened ourselves yes. up to a demonic realm that can come against us. Now, is that is that everybody? No, it's not everybody. But we are opening ourselves up, subjugating ourselves, that the enemy can come in and, and attack us. Yeah. Absolutely right. It's, a, it's like letting go of letting go of the wheel, and yes, giving control over to someone else to um, pilot the ship. Mm -hmm. It uh, it, was, it made me think of a passage in another one in Proverbs: "Who hath woe?" This is Proverbs chapter three, starting with verse twenty-nine. 23:29 who hath woe who hath sorrow who hath contentions who hath babbling who hath wounds without cause who hath redness of eyes they that tarry long at the at the wine they that go to seek mixed wine look not thou upon the wine when it is red when it giveth its color in the cup when it moveth itself aright at the last it biteth like a serpent and singeth like an adder well, the, uh, the, the serpent represents Satan, of course. I mean, that kind of hand given. And then toward the end is the last verse of the chapter there, verse 35. And this is more or less the, the, the individual, I'll, I'll say the victim, because that's really what they are. They'll go on to say, They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. So they, they go on autopilot. 
they, they open themselves up, something else takes control, they're unaware of what happened. They're, they're beaten, they're, they're robbed, they're taken advantage of, they, they wake up and they're, <laughs> they're a mess because they let control of their heart, of their mind, and someone else took, took the reins and ran with it. Right. And they were exposed to all kinds of things and then they wake up and they say, well, I, I, let me go seek it again. Most of the time it's because they have to appease themselves the next morning because they're, they're having a hangover and they're, they're, uh, they're messed up. But that's a, that's a very good analogy of, of letting someone else take control. And that's exactly, I think, is what really happens. I've seen it and others have experienced it. But Jesus wants to deliver you. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus wants to take your life and turn it around and put good things in your life. But you, you're a free moral agent, and you have to make good choices. Amen. You're a free moral agent. You have to choose not to let your mind alter. That's right. And you have to choose not to let people come in your life that's going to tempt you, that's going to, to, uh, to try to take you to a place where you don't want to go. Or you made yeah. a decision you don't want to go. So you might want to go there, but you made a decision not to go there. Does that make sense? So in yes, other words, does. in other words, your your emotions, and and your your senses and and your your craving, they want to go there. But you've made you purposed in your heart. You made a decision that enough is enough, and I'm not going to go there. Or you you've come to the place where you've seen uh, mind alterating drugs, drugs, alcohol. Uh, sex addiction you've seen that in your family and you said that's not going to be under my doorstep right. that's not going to be at my doorstep that that's not going to be in my home because i'm not going to give the devil the demons a place in my house right so you, not only my house like my 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 physical house but my my spiritual house my my body my my mind my emotions my feelings my senses I'm not going to give a place for that to happen in my home. That's right, and that's a choice. And in the jail ministry that I'm involved in, we deal with a lot of guys that have been down some rough roads. And we tell them that if you really want to make yourself better, if you want to do better, you have to change your playground and you have to change your playmates. You there can't you go. go to the Come same on. places where you've been going, where you've gotten in trouble, and I can attest to that. I, had to do it myself, and you can't hang around with the people that you used to hang around with that are going to drag you down. And there's no no better explanation than the life that each of us are living today is a result of the choices that we made in the past. Mm -hmm. And I made a choice in 1979 that I wanted to follow Jesus, and it's changed my life completely and Amen. totally. So it's all choices. Amen. Amen. So you're you work with a drug and alcohol. You go in what three days a week there, right? I'm actually I'm I'm there four days personally. Four, four days there, ministering to the bulk of those men or substance abuse. The bulk of them are. The yeah. Bulk of them. Yes. The bulk of them are substance abuse that someone helped them, took them down the wrong road. Correct. And they're in there for what? 90 days or some roughly. are just there a few days some are a few weeks some are uh, the, the max is about uh, I think there was one guy in there about six months that was the max so that's max that's radical yeah that's radical end of it uh, a few but, days to a couple months so they take guys in there and they slap their hands or they're not in prison but it's a form of prison it's an incarceration yeah, facility it's yeah. incarceration facility and they're in there with all these other guys that have the same problem same. they have. Yep. And you're taking the light of the gospel, the light of Jesus in there, and four days a week and saying, hey, there's a better way. Amen. Right? Amen. Exactly. Like maybe you never heard of this one called Jesus. But he can not only save your soul, he can, he can help deliver you. Correct. Because I don't think God delivers you totally. You, you have... There, there's a part that you have to play. Yes. That is right. There's a part you, you have to play. That first the part is you have to make a decision. I'm going to change. That right? is correct, yes. And I tell them, 
we tell them, I, there's other ministers with me, and we tell them, just like the Billy Graham Crusades, he, they used to sing a song, Just As I Am. You, God wants you just as you are. Don't try to get rid of all your garbage and become perfect, because you're not going to become perfect to start with. But that was my thought when I first started thinking I wanted to get spiritually right that I had to become perfect before God would accept me. No, he wants you to come just as you are, and he'll help you. You submit to him, and he will help you get rid of the baggage and the garbage that you're carrying with you. Mm -hmm. So you, you purpose in your heart to make a decision, I'm going to change. Right. But the second thing is, you need the power of the Holy Spirit, and you need the power of the Word to back that up, Amen. or you're, you're going to fall. Amen. Now, you guys are all pretty deep Christians, am I all wet, or, you know, am I, am I hitting this here, or? No, you're, out, you're right on the, you're hitting the nail on the head. The, the power is in the Word of God. The Word of God, the Bible says that we're supposed to renew our mind with the washing of the Word. Mm -hmm. So, to, to take the old out, we can take it out, but we got to put something back in right. it. Yeah. And that's the washing of the Word of God by His stripes. Yeah. I'm healed. You know, we we have to learn those scriptures, and we have to to uh, to apply them to our life, and we have to 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 speak them in over our life to where they become root in our life. So just like mind-altering drugs, it takes a root in our life. We all agree with that. Mm -hmm. yes, it's absolutely. a root. Some of that root is deep for some people, and some it's shallow, but it it. It has a finger and it's down into our life. And so uh, so we have to take the Word of God and we have to we have to cultivate it, we have to plant it. We have to uh, to 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 work it to where our to where we know our spirit man believes it, but our mind has to believe yes. it. Mm -hmm. So we have to change our mind set. Or we have to reprogram our mind. We have to reboot our mind. Uh, lots of ways you could say it. <clears throat> but, but we have to basically uh, convince our mind that the Word of God is more powerful than that substance. Am That's I, right. Am I right? Or sure. Right. You guys want to throw something in here? I mean, it... Well, you're talking about uh, having something in you in place of the mind-altering substance and, and things. It made me think of um, Jesus' words in Matthew 12, verse 43, refer, referring to uh, the, an unclean spirit that was delivered out of a person. Yes. He says, when the unclean spirit, and this can apply to any kind of evil spirit of sorts, but or it could be an alcoholic spirit, which that's kind of another, another layer too, but when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding and, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came. That house is the person that was delivered. Right. Um, Jesus delivered a person, and that spirit left. But for some reason, the spirit says, I'm going to go right back in. And when he came back, he finds that house. Let me read here. Then he, said, then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. And that's the Christian. They've been delivered. Everything has been clean, swept, garnished, and ready for the next step, which is what you're referring to, that being filled with the Spirit and the Word, that's going to take residence in the heart of a person. Come on. But if it's empty, then he goeth, then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other seven. spirits, more than wicked. Why? Because there's more room. Everything's cleared out of the heart of a person. So it's not just one thing to get forgiveness and, and let go of things in, in our hearts. We have to have those added ingredients yeah. mm -hmm. in order for it to take, take refuge. So it's, it's a warning here of those who do not go to the next step on being filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. so, so let's break that down. So a guy comes to you, accepts Christ. You, he denounces his addiction, denounces his stronghold. He accepts Christ. He's a new creation new creation that's correct mm -hmm. but Amen. he's clean but there's nothing in there to fill that void because he's not done the the work or he's not done the uh the study to fill that with the power of the word and the power of the spirit that's right mm -hmm. that's right so we have a we have a lot of people that come into our to our, our christian gatherings i'll say 
and they get healed, they get delivered, they get set free, but who's discipling them that when they walk out that door, the enemy comes and knocks on their door and says, oh, yep. you've not filled that person, you've not filled that place in your spirit and in your, your mind, you've mm-hmm. not filled it with the power of the word of God, you've not filled it with with yep. being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you're a Christian, but you're empty. Yep. So I have the right to come back in exactly where I was before, right where we left off. We're mm-hmm. picking up again, but I'm bringing some of my friends with me. Yep. Is that, is that? That's exactly be, right. Because I think a lot mm-hmm. of people don't get that. Yep. You know, a lot, a lot of people don't get that. It's like, well, I had an experience, you know, at this Christian gathering, and yeah, I, you know, but yeah, I don't know now. Well, they didn't further their walk with Christ. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah, you've got to get some prayer time in. you got to start looking at the Word, reading the Word, finding out what it says. Don't just trust what the preachers are telling you. Get in there and <laughs> confirm it and read it for yourself. Spend time with the Lord. And you know, that there's this... Uh... I like what you had said, Ray. Um, you're bringing in this this very critical point of mentorship and discipleship that is so needful. And uh, but uh, just a side thought, you know, this issue of justification of different ones wanting to justify taking drinking or these other ways of dealing with their stress. It's this like kind of how this little article kind of puts it. It's, it's 5:30 on a Friday at the end of a long week and you've just gotten home, your boss yelled at you, you had to deal with an angry customer, and all you want to do is kick back and blow off some steam with a few drinks. It's been a long week and you've earned a hard drink or three, right? You know, well, for us, if we had a rough week, if things happened, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer about it. We're not going to go to a bottle. That's something that's going to taste terrible and it's going to have ramifications that are totally not. But for some, that is their only source of out. That's their only, only stress relief. And, mm-hmm. and to circle back with, with this issue, this critical issue of mentorship and discipleship, those, and you know more, more a lot along these lines, because a community of those that you can get strength from is so important, especially yeah. those that are trying to come away from that. They had to have a place to go. Yes. And I think as Christians among the believers in the kingdom, we almost had to be that much, you know, just as much as this spirit is ready to bring reinforcements on a second round to destroy this individual. How much more should the kingdom of God's dear son and the, the soldiers that are here laboring, we need to go on the offense to realize they, this, is a, this is becoming a spiritual battle. It's not just a, a natural battle, even though in all in all of its nature, it is life-altering substances, whether it be drugs, alcohol, whatever. But it's, it's, it roots deeper to a spiritual battle. And I think most people don't realize that, especially the victims. In the, in the midst of their deception, in the midst of their stress, this is the only thing in the natural that they can have to hold on to, to give them some kind of relief. But they, they have to be coached. They have to be mentored. They have to have a safe place to come to that's full of people who go on the offense for them. I think that mentorship point you brought up is a, is another key here. Because if they feel like there's no place else to go, they're going to go right back to that, just like yep. just like Lot, Lot's wife. She turned around. There was something in her that said, wait a minute, that's home. <laughs> that was home to her. But even Jesus, that was one of the shortest scriptures of the Bible, aside from Jesus wept, is remember Lot's wife. Yeah. You know, And another one that's short but powerful is pray without ceasing. We got to pray and seek the face of God because when we realize that this is a, a, a wicked spiritual battle, there's a, there's a deceiver and an enemy whose only role is to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. And and we have to go on the offense. And this is definitely not a layback topic for sure. It's a serious one. Amen. Well, I, I, while we're some of the keys, one of the biggest keys is instead of coming home and opening a refrigerator we need to turn on worship music yes that's you know the the enemy satan the adversary he was the chief worshiper mm-hmm. 
and he he was so close to God that he thought he could be God. But his power is in is in music. He knows mm -hmm. he knows the power that is in music also. When we turn on worship music, anxiety goes automatic. Mm -hmm. When we turn on worship music, depression goes. When we turn on worship music, we start our emotions and our senses and our feelings, we start we start relaxing. Yes. Mhm. Mm and so that's a key for someone that's coming out of the world and coming into knowing Jesus is one of the keys is is worship. You know, battle it by worship. Yes. And and uh and uh, I know my wife is big on that, you know, and, and when she gets down or whatever, she'll turn the worship music on. And she told a, a guy that went back to rehab this week, she said, you know, when I get depressed, I, I turn on I turn on God's worship. Amen. I turn on worship and, and I read my Bible. I don't want to read my Bible, but I read my Bible. She reads her Bible because she needs it, not because she wants to. And, and those are some of the keys of, of uh, coming out of, of, a, of a lifestyle of a d addiction. Um, th there's ways to come out of it. It just doesn't happen overnight. Right. It's a, it, you, you, you walked into it slowly and it's a battle to come back out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a battle to come back out of it because when you win, you're not going to go back. That's right. So, Stephen, you have a testimony. Why don't you go ahead and give it? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of experiences, and uh, I will say that just when we're talking about alcoholism and how how what an impact that can have on a person's life, and uh, especially those around them. If anyone is, you know, if not, maybe not necessarily have been an alcoholic, but have suffered, you know, because of a loved one that. It, it is difficult because it affects them differently, especially as a child. I, I remember my father had struggled with, with alcoholism. And I, I still remember probably my youngest, earliest memory I have was just as a little boy. And remember my father coming home. I was excited to see him. But uh, he looked like my father, at least in part. But because he was so intoxicated, he, he didn't quite look like him. And I was took him back. I'm ready to run up to him. Hey, Dad, Dad's home. And all of a sudden, I'm realizing how he's talking, how he's acting. This is this has got to be him, but it sure doesn't look like him. It doesn't seem like him. And and I, and that uh, scared me for the first time. I still remember that. I I was I was so young. I might have been four or five. I was maybe even younger. But that was my earliest memory of realizing, wait a minute, this is very awkward. This should be my father. This should be the one that comes home. I'm excited to see him, but there's, then there's this, um, this other man that's in my home that's you know, acting. And, and, and I won't go down the details of other experiences along the way where you know, it, it wasn't so subtle. It was more violent, waking up all night, you know, hearing the conflict between him and my mother. Um, yeah, th those things don't go away. They're scars, and you know, yeah, you can recover from from pain and wounds, but the scars always there, mental scars. And uh, seeing the the man you should respect, and who should be the protector, the the provider, the guide in your life, and he's not who he should be. He's and then he's and then you see your mother, who should be protected and cherished and nourished, being victimized by the man you're supposed to respect and be the, be the, the strength in the family. Here, that's the source of weakness the enemy comes in. Those, those are things that will haunt a child in the night. 
well, you should be able to sleep safely in your bed because you're a little boy and my sister, you know, was with me. And we experienced very difficult things because of that. And it takes getting beyond that. I don't know if you ever really get over it, but you get beyond it enough to where emotionally you learn some things and you look back and you realize that wasn't my father. He was also a victim. But it takes... <laughs> I'm not sure if I even have the words to, to really express what it takes in order for someone who goes through those things at such a young age to be able to cope with them. But enough to know we're all victims in that and to know that even the man himself was victimized by that. Um, I, will, I will share an experience that I had when, uh, well, there's a lot of, a lot of details leading up to it, but uh, it was, I was... 18 years old and ready to graduate, you know, get my life going. I was in vocational training to go get a job placement out of, out of high school. And a lot of things were coming together at the same time. I, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do um, when I got to high school. And uh, my sister had moved out. My mother was disabled and having, having conditions. And then here my father was still struggling with his alcoholism. And and I was going through a lot of personal things at a time. It was very difficult, including my father's drinking. And um, I remember coming home one night from church. Um, my aunt and uncle at the time were dropping me off. I didn't have my license, so I was <laughs> trying to get my license. So I really, in, in many ways, was trapped. I was trying to find my way. Um, I don't, when I graduated high school, what I was going to do and where I was going to go, I didn't have a place to go. I felt so alone. And I come home and my do and, and here. My father is intoxicated and very argumentative, and um, and we, we had gotten in a, in a fight. The very first time I ever really tried to reason with someone. You can't reason with someone when they're like that. But I was just uh, I was up to here with with things, and here I thought that I could confront, and I don't know why, but we ended up getting in a scuffle. Nothing too terribly serious, but it, it just realized, I realized where I was at. I needed help. I needed, I needed deliverance for myself. I wanted out. I can't run away. Where are we going to go? I had a pretty decent head on my shoulders. And um, my aunt had given me some prayers because she was a very praying woman and I, I miss her very dearly. Um, and at that time I was giving my life back to God. I was really changing some things. And I went upstairs and I uh, I, I, I did only, the only thing I could do was fall on my knees and cry out to God Amen. and pray. And I'm, I'm a born again, spirit filled believer. And I, and I let the Holy Spirit make intercession for me. And I prayed to the God of heaven and I prayed those prayers and I started worshiping. And I prayed myself through all of that. And I cried and prayed myself to sleep. And I woke up in the middle of the night. And the room was charged, and I knew someone was in there with me. And the Lord just peeled back my vision, and I had an angelic experience where an angel came in my room. And I saw some amazing things and uh, supernatural things, bright light and peace. And the Holy Spirit just came in my room so strong. And that was an experience I will never forget, but it was God sending a comforter to say, I'm here with you, I'm, I'm with what you're going through. And... Uh, and, it, and that was a turning point in my life because it let me know that God knew exactly where I was at. And He sent an angel and I had a heavenly experience. Amen. And from that moment on, I had a closer walk with God and I had some amazing experiences after that. And I needed them. Not that we seek God for, uh, you know, seeing into the spirit realm or seeing angels. Right. or Those are wonderful experiences, but I needed that because from that moment on, I had such a close walk with the Lord. I, I then realized He was in me. And I, I wasn't walking alone from that moment right. on. And I needed that because I was going through all those changes, graduating high school and getting a job and moving on. And I had my aunt and my uncle who was there for me in many ways. And, and this isn't the end of the story because my father, even though he struggled with that, he has a testimony of his own. And he's been delivered and clean from that condition for a long time. And he, and he, had, he had deliverance in his own way. I can't. I don't want to take his testimony away, but, and I still love him and respect him because he's a, he's a very humble, God-fearing, faithful man who, who dealt with a lot of things going through that. Again, I, 
keep repeating myself, but these are, these are victims. These are our brothers and sisters, men, that are going through this. Because um, there's women that struggle with alcoholism too, but this is a, a men's gathering. I know we're dealing with men that struggles, but it's a, across the board. But they're victims. But when they get to victory, they're shouting in heaven when they get to victory. And I needed that experience for a turning point in my life. Because I, I struggled, my sister struggled with our father, and my mother, she drunk too, but uh, I wouldn't say she had the, if, if I had to label the person who really had the, the real problem, it was my father. Um, but he did get the victory out of, after all of that. And, uh, but it, it affects people from a very young age. And you can, and uh, to still be able to look back and look at those memories, it just shows that there are still scars. But when we get farther enough in it and we trust in the great God of heaven, who, who, who alone can really bring deliverance and healing in all this. He'll give, you, he'll give you the victory and testimonies that will be, in, in my estimation, far more impressionable than the negative ones. Because mm -hmm. when you have God showing up and sending angels and in giving deliverance, where one day a person has an addiction and the next day they don't, it, it takes God to really turn that golden key in the heart of any man or woman. And when He does, it is a wonderful, amazing Amazing thing for God to come to your rescue like that. So, so if I could cap on a couple, two things, but the first one is you were angry and you tried to reason with someone that was under the influence of a drug, and you you mm -hmm. can't reason with people. No. And as as born again, uh, spirit filled. Christians or as deep Christians or as people that's walked with God there, there's, there should be no place in our life for that temptation No, that we would drink a little and then all at once the world crashes in and we drink too much and we ruin our relationship with our family, with our, with our loved ones, with, with our friends uh, talking, I call it talking stupid, I don't know how else to put it, but there's people that's been under the influence and I try to talk to them and you, you might as well talk to a block wall because mm -hmm. their mind is not reasoning properly. Their mind is reasoning, reasoning. Mm -hmm. they're, they're thinking about it, they're, they're telling you something, but uh, as my dad used to say as an electrician, uh, the light was on, but nobody was home. <laughs> and and, yeah. and, and mentally, uh, the, the good decisions aren't home, but the bad decisions are mm -hmm. home. And, and, and lying and justifying, and those are all alive in there yeah. when, they're on a, when we're on an alternating drug. But the, the, the proper decision making is, is not it's not there. No. And, and so your dad couldn't really, you know, it wasn't the time to talk to your dad, but you didn't know it. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and your emotions and all those things. And so as a men's thing here, if somebody is intoxicated or drugged up, um, all you can do is pray for them and let them sober up. Amen. And, yeah. and then talk to them mm -hmm. because they're under the influence of demonic yeah. the demonic realm that's just it they're under the influence of demonic realm and demonic spirits follow drugs alcohol weed there there there's a there's an assignment for demons to follow that yep uh, just like there's assignments for god's angels to follow those that follow the word of god yes, follow right. the spirit of god Amen. we have angels behind us we have angels of God in this room because we are shedding the light of the gospel the light of Jesus and 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 that influence that we have they're drawn in yep. the demonic realm of Jesus is drawn into us because of our topic and because mm -hmm. of who we who's inside of us right yep. and when we take a mind alterating drug then that is the opposite. The devil has an opposite of everything God has. So when, when we're under the influence, the demons are drawn in to talk through us, to, to do stupid things, to do those things. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. 
no Christian should be Ray Dorshuk standard. No Christian should have one drink, I believe. Uh, it's in the Bible. There, you know, you can push it either way in the Bible. But the thing is, uh, we need to be the light of the world, yep. and we 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 need to we need to we need to live focus that Jesus is our answer. Right. Jesus is our answer, and and temptation is there for all of us. None of us are above temptation. No. And and uh, and I was in a. I could give you examples, but I don't need to, I guess. But everybody tells me I only drink a little bit. They're drinking a lot more than a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people. Oh, <laughs> I just had a guy about three months ago tell me you know just does a little bit and, and uh, something happened and he would he, he he has the hard stuff you know back in the <laughs> back in the corner so my point is it's a temptation yeah and some can control it some can't but if you can control it we're still supposed to be accountable to god our, our life is supposed to be spotless just yeah. like jesus our life is supposed to be, uh, we're supposed, to, people are supposed to pattern their life behind a born again Christian. Right. And, and, and uh, I deal with enough things to try to keep my life, try to keep that pattern of things of God without putting questionable things in mm-hmm. there that I could fall or that I can cause someone else right. to fall. Man, right. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and your dad, you always love your parents, but yeah. he put a mark on you, on on you and your sister. And like you said, he was a victim. That that victim, if you would go back to your father's past, somebody put a mark yeah. on his life. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And as a as a as a Christian that is born again, spirit filled, we don't want to put any marks on people's mm-hmm. lives. We want to take marks Amen. off of people's lives. Yeah. Yes. That's why you're. That's why you're four days a week in there. You know, telling those men that, hey, I was once here, and now I'm there. Amen. You know. And, and yeah. God forgives. God loves us. God cares for us. But we're not supposed to do anything to cause <laughs> someone else to stumble. Mm-hmm. It says a little that's one right. to stumble, but that's basically someone that is looking up to us. There's always yeah. someone watching us. There's yeah. always someone that's patting our lives after us, even if we don't know it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And uh, and I, and I can give you names that people that I kind of picked up things in their life, and I patterned my life off of their life, and they they don't know it. They don't know it, but I know it. I know where that I know where that decision that came, from. came from because I seen someone mm-hmm. else make that decision. And right. It, it worked. You know, right. it works. You know. It does. So that's an awesome, awesome testimony. And, you know, there were times I, <laughs> I didn't even want to go to certain restaurants, you know, because, you know, pubs have really good food, you know, good burgers and fries. And I, I struggled with going to certain places, even like Applebee's or Texas Roadhouse, you know, because there's, you know, bars, you know, mm-hmm. scenes and, and alcohol. And, and it took me a while before I finally got enough to where I, I felt like, all right, well, I, I know I'm, myself I'll have a glass of wine once in a while and I I tried that but I I know that that's that that my 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 uh, conscience is pricked by that because I know that's not what I should even do even on special occasions it's easy to say oh it's a special occasion it's holidays or you're at a party or something maybe a little drink or something but it took it took a while to even feel like I could even let my guard down even try that but even when I did there's that conviction in my heart I realized, you know what, I shouldn't even have anything to do with this. I'd rather, rather be clean and not have any of this. Because I remember even going to, the, you, going to youth meetings and church meetings and hearing ministers tell us, even as a young man and as young people, it says, always remember who you are and what you represent. You are a child of God and you represent the kingdom of His dear Son. And carry that with you wherever you go and let that affect your decision making. Because it all comes down, you keep going back, because it is really a spiritual battle, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Paul told the Corinthian church, he listed many things that they were going through and things they were giving themselves to. And he says, what? Know you not that your body is, a, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 
which you have of God's, and you're not your own. Therefore, I glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. When we surrender our Lordship to Jesus, and He is now our Lord, we're to, we're to follow these teachings and say, you know, I can't do the things, nor do I want to do them. There's a, there's a nature change that will happen as we're being filled with the Spirit, going back to that, being filled with the Spirit to take place of these things that we want to put in our heart. It's... <laughs> It's a, it's a terrible, cheap substitute for the consolation and the peace, the rest, and the assurance we can get through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why anyone would want to go that? They, they just don't know of another alternative. Yeah. And until they do, they're, they're going to go with what the best that they have. But uh, I think that these experiences we have and these scars, and as much as difficult as they are, and a lot of experiences that we all have, we wouldn't give a million dollars for them because of what they've taught us and how they... If we take them right, they can bring us closer to God and we can get stronger because of it and become a, a product instead of a prisoner of these things. Amen. <clears throat> we talked about it as a child and everything. One scripture that I've been wanting to, to bring up was Samson. You know, Samson's mother wasn't given the wine when she was carrying Samson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if... His mother wasn't given the wine. Don't you think he was not supposed to be given the wine too? Mm -hmm. And his fall was yes. when he was drunk. Mm -hmm. He yeah. let his guard down. Yes. And we're, we're to never let our guard down. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Samson was kind of a hero of the faith as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. you know, he was a mighty, mighty man of God. Powerful man of God, big time mm -hmm. wrestling, basically, Amen. what we put it to today. <laughs> but, you know, he's a powerful man yeah. of God, mm -hmm. and yet alcohol took him out. Yeah. And if his mother wasn't given the wine, then I think Samson wasn't supposed to be given the wine. God, God, I think he he knows he knows the path you're going to walk before you walk it. He knew yeah. that path that that Samson was going to walk mm -hmm. before he walked it, and he warned him. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he warned him, and yet, and yet, he let the lust of the flesh override the man of God of who he was. <laughs> exactly. And isn't that, that's a, such a powerful account in Scripture, because it, it shows how this man had this, this calling on his life, and he let his guard down in that weakness. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it took out his vision. And you think about this battle that we're in, it's, it's, an, it's an effort, it's an avenue to, de, to really destroy our mission. It's to destroy our purposes in life. We let our guard down, we want to ease up, we want to, we want to release. We want, and, then, and, then, and if we learn from anything from, from Samson is, my goodness, look, with, even, God, even though God was patient, long-suffering, and dealing with his heart, he still kept going over. He, he, the women and alcohol were his weaknesses. And ultimately, it cost him his vision. And that ought to be a warning to every man of God that let's not ignore the beckoning call of God that he'll give us time and time. He's merciful. That though, a, though, a, though a righteous man falls seven times, you know, he'll rise again. Keep on getting back up. But let's not let uh, the enemy take our, take our sight, take our vision, because... Without a vision, the people perish. We have to see where we're going and, and our hope that we have to not let that guard down. Amen. Amen. That's true. So Samson is, uh, for men's ministry, he, he's the top. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he had a call in his life, you know. He was rolling. I mean, he, 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 had, he had guts. He had wit. He, he was intelligent. He had a law, and yet, like you said, a, mm -hmm. a woman and alcohol took him down. A man's weakness, mm -hmm. you know. So we're supposed to give no place to the devil. Yeah. Amen. Right. Know? And so for some men, that's women. When you get my age, not a little less, a lot less, but when you're young, that's a big temptation, you know. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is a big temptation yeah. when you're young. Yeah. And uh, those, those young years... Are, are going to set you where you're going to be when you get older and and we need to, to tell our younger men that mm -hmm. don't put those scars on your life oh, yep don't put those scars talk about S S Samson he had some scars buddy like you said his <laughs> eyes were taken out yeah 
It was used as a mule, basically, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that there was someone there whipping him when he wasn't working. Oh yeah. I mean, he was in slavery. You know, that was that's what they did for slaves. He was a slave. Yeah. You know, he was he was an animal, basically, is how mm -hmm. they used him. So he went from a mighty man of God to a, a, a slave that people laughed at him. Yeah. That's what sin. That's what what. what uh, uh, codependency stuff that's what it will do to us it'll make us a slave just just like him yeah it's a real right. deceiver and his samson's hair that was over his head was his covering and that shows we have a covering on our life god's Amen. watching over us and Amen. any of these things that we do uh, that in the under the guise of leisure or um, relaxing or just letting our guard down really is what it really comes to is we're getting out from underneath the covering of God and, yeah. and that's a dangerous place to be especially when the enemy's really got us in his sights yeah. you know some people he has already deceived and but if he can get the shining ones <laughs> yeah. um, all lives matter obviously everybody's important and, and, and salvation is to anyone but he's looking for principal people that he can destroy because he knows he has enough intelligence not to give the enemy more credit than he deserves, right. but he's wise, he's smart, and he knows certain individuals, just if he can knock them down, if he can get the soldiers and the leaders out of the way, yeah. there you go. those that are looking to those men, those women, those people that have a powerful influence, a powerful calling, like Samson, everyone was looking to him. But if, if he can get Samson out of the way, same thing with the Lord. He tested him, if thou be the Son of God, three times, commanded the stones he may read. Cast yourself down. Angels will protect you. Right. You know, man, here, fall down and worship me. I'll give you all these kingdoms. Everything. I mean, the enemy evidently had power to be able to give those kingdoms to the Lord. Because he showed them, if you worship me, I'll give these to you. So there's things that the enemy will give people in this life, along with it, hardship, destruction, and eternal damnation is the end. I choose life. Amen. <laughs> I so, choose life. So your testimony, I think I'd just look look in the cameras there and just, just pray for somebody. Right now, right now there's someone there. Yeah. There's someone there right now that you're watching us and God is speaking to you. God is ministering yes. to you right now yes. through his testimony. So we're, we're gonna pray. Yeah, let's pray for them. Amen. God of heaven. God of all mercy, God of all comfort, all-knowing, compassionate God. Yes. There are so many, oh God, that are out there, men and women, children, young and old, that are victims and being victimized by alcoholism and all, all kinds of addictions, really, even though the topic here is, is alcoholism. But there's all kinds of things in this life that want to intoxicate people, to deceive and lead them astray. Oh, holy God of heaven. Deal in these hearts. Anyone listening and watching, send them peace. Send them comfort right now. Send them consolation, Lord. Draw them near to the help that they need. Uh, someone, send someone in their life to lead them into the, into the light and lead them to a place where they can find healing, rest for their souls. Because ultimately, oh God, that's what we all all. We are all your children seeking your rest, seeking your peace. Please help these ones, all these that are broken. Lord, they open their hearts to you. As you open your heart to God, I pray you find the peace. I pray you find the light and the help that you need. We ask this, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we got a great testimony. Well, well you got one. God's got I've a great heard, testimony. I've heard the testimony a few times. God's got a great testimony. My story began when I was just a child. My uh, my parents were divorced. Actually, I'll, I'll start a little further back than that. When my dad came home from World War II, he met my mom shortly thereafter, and he was in his 20s. He was about 24, and she was a young gal, and by the time she was 17, they dated for about six months, and then she got pregnant with me, and by the time she had delivered me, I was, she was 17. When I was born, my dad was about 24, so uh, we were only together as a family as far as I can been told I was you know I don't remember back that far about a year and a half I was a year and a half old when they split up got divorced and went their separate ways my mom remarried fairly quickly and married another guy and had two daughters with him 
my dad moved on, but he didn't get remarried right away, but he eventually get, got married. And I had a stepmom and a stepdad. And uh, long story short, my dad had visitations on, on weekends, and I got to go with him almost every weekend when I was just a little kid. And I, that's, the only, you know, that's the way I thought life was, you know, your mom and dad. But I was the only one I found out in my class that I was the only one with parents that were split up. They all lived together. And I, I just took it in stride because my dad loved me and my mom loved me. And it wasn't like they hated each other and always arguing and things. My dad always paid the child support, and I got to go with him. And he had a part-time job. He worked a full-time job in a print shop, and he had a part-time job at a tavern in Kenmore, and he was a bartender. And when he had me for the weekends, I went with him to that bar. I was a six, seven-year-old kid going with him to the bar, and that's the life I grew up around. And my stepdad, he drank also. He had a brother-in-law who had a vineyard, and they, they made wine. And there was always wine at our house. There was always wine under the sink, always a gallon jug under the sink. And I started drinking when I was about 12. It was just always there, and everybody was drinking and so I started sneaking into it when I was about 12 years old and I started liking the feel of it after I drink enough just to make me feel good and then I got to drinking more and more and I was kind of stupid back then and when I drink about that much out of it I would fill that back up with water so he wouldn't know I drank it after about the third time he came and he grabbed me and he said boy and I'm not going to tell you exact words he said but he said if you're going to drink the stuff, drink it, but don't ruin the blankety-blank stuff for everybody else. So I, that was an open door for me to, okay, I can drink it, I just don't have to replace it anymore. So I, so I did. I continued to, and I didn't overdo it at first, but then I got overdoing it and got, the, got my buddies to overdo it. You know, I'd sneak some out and we'd, we'd have parties. So drinking was a big part of my life since about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And as I grew older, uh, I had several experiences where I had DUIs and had to go to jail and different things and all because of drinking. I never got in trouble when I was sober. But I have a little article, it's a short article, I'd like to read it. Here's how my life was back then. And the article's titled, this was in the Akron Beacon Journal back in 1975, and it, the, the article's titled, A Button Push and He's Gone. And it says, a 24-year-old Akron man escaped from the police station the easy way early today. He took the elevator. I just pushed the elevator button and went downstairs, said David L. Horner of 906 Boulevard Street. The officers were talking, and I guess they didn't see me. Besides, I was just looking for the bathroom. Patrolman Robert Hoff says he was talking with his partner, Thomas Hooper, about Horner's arrest Thursday night when uh, Horner disappeared. Horner was charged with driving while intoxicated and carrying a concealed weapon after police stopped him near his home on a motorcycle, searched him, and allegedly found a knife. Hoff said he looked up from the conversation just in time to see the elevator doors closing in the fifth floor of the police station. Hooper ran down to the fourth floor and Hoff to the first floor looking for their prisoner. They couldn't find him and broadcast the escape attempt on their radio. Dozens of officers began looking for Horner. He was found hiding in the bushes out alongside the city county safety building, police said. He was charged with escape. So I had a lot of charges on that, that night of what I thought was fun. And long story short, it cost me a lot of money to get out of that, that deal. I was charged with escape and had to go through a lot of problems. And uh, I was 24, as I was married, and we had two children at that time, and my wife was pregnant with the third. And I'm out running around feeling that I earned the right to go drinking on Friday nights because I worked hard all week and took care of my family. I made sure they had food, shelter, and clothes. and everything, but I decided, I, you know, I felt that I deserved to be able to go out and have fun. But my fun always cost, cost me a lot, mm -hmm. and not including arguments with my wife when I did finally get home. But uh, that carried on for 10 years. We were married in 1969, right? I was right out of high school. I kind of was like my dad. Uh, she became pregnant. We were dating for two years. I met her when she was 14. By the time she was 16, I had gotten her pregnant, and we got married right after high school. Uh, I was in, I was, she was in 10th grade. She had to quit high school, but I had just graduated. And even though I wasn't going to church, I wasn't a Christian, my wife was raised in a Christian home. And when we met, we really hit it off together. And uh, she really was attracted to me and I was attracted to her. And over that two year period, 
Uh, she thought she was going to bring me up to her level and get me saved and born again and go to church and everything, but I drug her down to my level and she ended up becoming pregnant out of wedlock. So even though I was a heathen, I knew the right thing to do in my heart because I was raised not to, wasn't from a Christian family, but we were taught to not lie, cheat, steal, or do any of those things. We were taught good morals, although I violated all those. And it ended up that uh, I knew the right thing to do would be get married. And I had buddies that tried to talk me out of it. Let's go to California. Let's get out of town. And, you know, I can't do that. So we got married. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, especially when I was drinking and, and I was dragging our family down. But God kept us together. And this September, in a couple months, we'll have been married 54 years. And I, it's by the by the grace of God, I give God the credit for that because I did everything I could to destroy the marriage. Uh, but God, God brought me along, Thank and God. in 1960, uh, 1979, uh, ten years after we'd gotten married, I gave my heart to Jesus. I finally decided I wanted to get spiritually right. My spiritual eyes were open. I was, I had been an athlete in high school. I, you know, I had a football scholarship offer, but because she was pregnant, we got married, and I didn't go play football. But, God took care of me the whole time, but I've been down that road with alcohol, and it's done nothing but ruin me. But when I gave that up, and when I came to know Jesus, just as I was, when I decided to give my heart to Jesus, I didn't quit drinking. I didn't think there was anything wrong with drinking because Jesus turned water into wine and so forth, and I was just a baby Christian. But my theology, theology was, I'm not, I know I can't go out to them bars and run around and do those things, so I quit doing that right away. But I kept drinking for a few months until I realized one day, you know, I've got a six-pack of beer. It's been sitting in the refrigerator for three weeks, and I haven't even touched it. God was just slowly taking that wow. desire away Thank from God. me. Thank God. Thank God. He took that total desire. I can, I can go into a Applebee's or any place that sells liquor. I can be standing mm -hmm. right in the midst of it. It doesn't tempt me one just bit. Take... God took that temptation totally away Praise from me. It was God. all God. To give him the credit. Hallelujah. I mean, I was going down the path to destruction, and I mm -hmm. never thought I'd leave, live the C50, let alone 72, but <laughs> I praise God. He, I give him all the glory. Thank the Lord. Taken, he just took my baggage that I had with me when I came to him and accepted him as my Savior, slowly just started working on me and getting the, the garbage out of my life, and I praise God. I'm, yes. I'm just blessed. Amen. Blessed by the best. Thank God. Mm. Thank but God. your past is what God's using. Right now i can relate to guys that are in there going through things that i went through and i tell them you know there's only one way and that's just way. to make up your mind you you want to do better and then strive to do that prayer is the key yes. prayer is the main key give your heart to jesus and then pray fill those voids that are once you're delivered fill that fill your heart Amen. fill that void with the word of god with praying and seeking to do good things for him Yes. And don't leave the police station, right? No, don't, and don't walk out of the police station unescorted. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's, uh, that, God used your past. Yes. For Amen. where you are today. Yes. He can Absolutely. take your weakness. He can take your struggle. He can take your, your bondage. And when he delivers you, and when you choose to clean up, yeah, then God uses that for a platform that Amen. you can help others. And that that's where you're at today. You're 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 trying to tell those young people. Most of them are younger. Most of them are young. We'll most of them are younger. Most there. of them are. I've been in there a few times with you. Most of them are younger, and you're trying to tell them, hey, there's a better way. Yes. Absolutely. I've been down both roads. And I'm staying on the road I'm on. The Jesus. narrow road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wide is the gate Wide that leads is, uh, to destruction Jesus. according to the, to our word. Right. Wide is the gate. There's lots of people going down that wide gate. Correct. There is. Yeah, there's lots of people. So, so why don't you, uh, let's have you do a prayer. Amen. Look in the Amen. camera and talk Amen. to the people and talk, talk to them. And Amen. Everyone. And I used to work for the electric company and... Now one thing we used to do is ground the the equipment. Uh, you have to have grounding to keep everybody safe. And on the high tower poles and stuff, we we take a we take a uh, a wire and hang it up in the air because when lightning hits, it hits the highest object. 
And so when I pray, I like to raise my hand because I, <laughs> because I believe that if something comes down from heaven, it's going to hit me, and I want to be yes. there. So, Amen. so let's let's pray. Amen. Bow your hearts with me as we pray. Lord, I yes. just come to you in the name of oh, Jesus, God. and we know there are a lot of people in the United States of oh, America God. and across the world who are addicted to alcohol yes. and to drugs and other mind-altering yes. substances. And God, we just come before you right now, and we're asking you to touch oh. hearts. Anybody that's watching this video, this round table, or anybody that is is able to hear, Lord, let them hear the message that there is nothing good that comes out of excessive drinking. And we praise you and thank you. I praise you and thank you personally for, for blessing me in the way you have, delivering me from that. And it's just a choice. I chose to come to you, Lord, and I'm asking you to let other people that are hearing this message choose to also change their lives if they're, if they're in a struggle where they're, they're not happy with the way their life's going, God, the only way to do is to open their yeah. spiritual eyes and to come to know Jesus as their Savior, first step, yeah. and then strive to serve Him. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll follow my yes, commands. And all through the Bible, there are rules and regulations that tell us that if we do this, we'll get that. Yes. And if we do good, we'll get good. And also the wicked yes. are not going to last. So God, we're just asking that you would touch hearts touch minds and open spiritual eyes so that people will come to know Jesus yes, and get rid of their addictions and things that are dragging them down. So God, we pray your heads protects around everybody that's yes, listening Lord, to this yes, message Lord, and we yes, praise Lord. you and thank you and ask you to bless them and their loved ones, God, not only with good yes, physical strength, health, speed, and energy, yes. but with a sound mind and with everything good. Your word says you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings yes. that we can't even contain them. So I'm praying that for our audience. I'm praying for everybody that may listen to this message. Yes. And we praise yes, you, we Lord. thank you, and we Hallelujah. also give you the thanks for the opportunity Blessed to do this. We give you praise name. and glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, you know, here at our round table is we're not trying to convince you of anything. We're trying to give you the facts that the power of the word, the power of the spirit is the way that we need to govern our lives, that we Amen. need to lead our lives, that we need to to, uh, to activate our lives and, and not the things of the world. Amen. You know, so hopefully we got to that point today that uh, we can't tell you what is right or wrong. All we can tell you is that substance abuse ruins lives. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's in each one of our families. I mean, it's, yes. it, there's no family that's exempt from that not touching their life and, and, and its scars. Yeah. And so if you're truly born again, why do you want to bring a why do you want to take the chance of scarring someone? See, Jesus wants us to bring healing to people. Right. Jesus wants us to introduce deliverance to people. Jesus wants us to take people and we he wants to mold and shape them into his image, but he wants to use you and he wants to use you and he wants to use me to, to mold those people into the image of God. We're, we don't come all put together. Amen. We, we, don't, we don't have it all together. There's areas in our life that we have it together pretty good, but there's other areas in our lives that mm -hmm. we need Jesus to Absolutely. help put us together. Absolutely. So would you cry out to Jesus today. Say, Jesus, here I am, a vessel. Would you come with your word and fill me? And I surrender my spirit, and I ask you to do a work in my spirit, to renew my spirit, renew my mind, renew my senses, renew my emotions, because I, 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 I'm, I'm all those things can, I, can you help me bring all those thoughts and things into captivity to the point that it's only Jesus, it's only the, the power of the Word of God. Yes. It's, it's, only, it's only about His will. Amen. Jesus said, not, not my will, but your will, Father. And there's too many times in our life when we're taking uh, uh, my will instead of His will. There's too many times in our lives when we're doing uh, what we think is right, which is our will, instead of surrendering what we think, surrendering what we will, and say, God, what, what do you have? 
what is best for my life? Mm -hmm. What is best for my family's life? And, and if we just stop and take a second and step back and just, just count the costs, count the costs, count the costs before we do things, we would do it differently. Amen. And, and uh, there's been too many times in my life was that I made a quick decision. I shouldn't have made that decision. <laughs> you know, and I think we, we have to train ourselves to step back and not speak first, but say, God, what do I need to do here? What is your will in my life on this situation? What, mm -hmm. how, how, how is it going to affect those around me? Because when we get down to that point, how is it going to affect those around me? We're going to make the right decision. Right. But too many times we make that decision on my will, how I feel, and not, God, what do you have for me? Mm -hmm. God, how's this going to affect the people around me? How's this going to even affect the next generation? Yes. Because there's someone watching us. Yes. There's someone following us. There's someone that's patterning their life after our pattern that we were shown, and we need to... Uh, we need to rebuke those things in our life that, that are not right, that, that, that was put in our life that is not, not according to God's word, that is not healthy, uh, that is not fruitful, that is not, uh, that, that's not going to bring the good, good report, the good answer, the, the good things that God has for us. It's going to stop that. And so we, we as Christian men... Uh, we need to look to the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of God, the Bible says. Amen. Yes. So there must be another way we could divide the Word, you know, rightly dividing the Word. Uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit says that He will be our teacher. Yes. So it's not what we think, but we need to say, hey, Holy Spirit, what, what are you trying to tell me here? How are you trying to mold me and shape me into the image of of God or into the image of a man that other people would marvel at your power that's in me, through me, around me. Will mm -hmm. people marvel that we were a Christian and, and they know we walked with God? They know we walked with God. Now, I have a lot of Christians that passed away and I wonder whether they really walked with God, you know? Yeah. And, and, and they're, they're past, they're gone, but I'm still here, you're still here. Are we walking with God to the point when, when we take our last breath, will people say, now there's a man that walked with God. Mm -hmm. There's a man that not only knew the word of God, but could, uh, could decipher the word of God or they could activate the word of God to where it was living inside of them that, they walked with God. Yeah. They walked with his word. Mm -hmm. They walked by the spirit. Yeah, they had their issues. They were not perfect, but they were always striving to be the man that yeah. God called them to be. Right. And that we should be the man that we're not causing someone to stumble. If it's if it's an area where someone will stumble, we shouldn't be doing it. We we need right. to we need to get it out of our life. We need we need to just discard it, and uh, and that's that's a process, because the world is revolving, and as the world revolves, we have th new things that face us. Yeah, and we have as the world revolves, we have things that come back up from our past. And the enemy will, will, will remind us of it. The Bible mm -hmm. talks about that. Yeah. And we have right. to say, I cast down every imagination, every high thing that is before God or, you know, is not of God. And so when those thoughts come up, we have to say, I, I, I dealt with that. I rebuke that thought. I cast it down. I, it's under the blood of Jesus. It is no longer in my life. Mm -hmm. Because the enemy will keep tempting us from time to time to different times different walks in our life, different seasons in our life, 
he wants to remind us of things in the past yeah that that he can bring depression defeat discouragement that he can bring unworthiness that's what the enemy that's that's his target amen and he's going to target each one of us as a born again spirit filled christian man he's going to target us and see if it'll work see if it's going to bounce yep. off of us that we're going to say i rebuke that god delivered me of that god healed me of that god set me free of that mm -hmm. and now today i claim that once again amen yeah is that where it's at that's talking about that guilt and shame uh, for some people they, they overcome to the point that that's no longer an issue but in, until that shame and guilt's gone use that to bring you to God instead of keep you away I think I think that factor of guilt and shame it causes people to think they're trapped and they can't do anything they can't seek help they, they won't go to a, a counselor or a mentor or a pastor or a close friend because they're too ashamed of I'm guilty of substance abuse or any kind of addiction. That's the first step of getting help is admit. being able to go to someone, admit, and then and go to God. Say, God, here I am with this feeling again. He'll, he'll never get tired of hearing from his children. Amen. I'm coming to you, Dad, for help. And take it to him. What, what the enemy can use against us, if we turn around and use that to defeat him and draw us closer to the solution rather yes. than keeping us away from it, so guilt and shame, those are natural emotions, and, and everybody's guilty of something. I mean, I, I may be guilty of having a bad day, and I have to repent. <laughs> I may have said something mean to my, my wife or my children, you know, because I have stress, and I have to repent to them about that, or if I've backslid in some way, because I'm still undone. I'm still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. But keeping that dialogue with God, that, God, I'm Amen. still struggling with this. I still feel guilty because of the thoughts, or maybe I fell into temptation again and slipped up again. Be like that in Proverbs. Rise again seven times. Keep getting back up and take that guilt, that shame back to the, to the cross and leave it there. And it'll become fewer and far between before you realize, I, I won't have a desire. I can go to any restaurant. I can go anywhere. None of that tempts me. I've, I have now been put beyond doubt. You can, you can set it in front of me and I won't partake in it because... Thanks to Calvary, I don't go there anymore. <laughs> I love that song that the Gaither vocal band sings. You know, mm -hmm. thanks to Calvary, I'm not the man I used to be. Thanks Amen. to Calvary, I don't go there anymore. Amen. 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 So we just want to pray with you right now, a prayer of deliverance. So if you if you just just get on your knees right where you're at and say, Jesus, yes, here am I. Yes, Lord, a sinner need of a savior father right now i ask you to come into my life i ask you to cleanse me i ask you to set me free yes lord father i need deliverance father i let things in my life that should not be in my life today i ask you to cover me with your blood I ask you to cover me with your blood from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and that you would cleanse me, cleanse my heart, cleanse my emotions, cleanse my feelings and my senses. Create in me a new heart, Father, yes, Lord. that I can be pure, not of anything that I've done, but because of your blood that's covering me right now. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for, for the third day you rose again. And that you sit on the right hand of the Father. With my name at the right hand of the Father. And that you're interceding for me. You're covering me with your blood. You're bringing me new. I am a new creation in you, Jesus. Now, Jesus, there's some voids in my life. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would teach me the word. Teach me the word, Holy Spirit, that I can remember it. And Holy Spirit, I invite you to come into my, to my heart right now. I give you place, Holy Spirit, into my life. I ask you to come in and fill me. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with, 
with the, your, my prayer language, Father. Your word says that I don't know what to pray for, but the Holy Spirit does. Yes, Lord. So I ask you to right now to take my lips, to take my vocal cords, and that you would, you would mold me and shape me, Father, that into the image where you'd have me to be. And Father, I'm going to get up from this prayer new. I've made a decision to change. I made a decision to cast down the things in my life that's not according to your word. And I'm believing that I'm made new. Now, Father, I ask you to bring Christians across my path that could help me, that could teach me, that could mentor me, that could, could speak into me. Father, you have an army out there of, of people. And I ask for those people of you, of Jesus, to come into my life and to mold me and to help shape me and to, to mentor me and to make me to make me new, to make me a better person. Help me not to struggle, Father, but bring the deliverance to me, moment by moment, second by second. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. amen. Well, we're thank you that you came, and we're thankful that you were part of our broadcast today. And we're just a bunch of guys that got together. We have a guy in the back, Paul, back there that that has this equipment that God's uh, let him have or has blessed him with that he's worked hard for. And it's it's not just the people up front. It takes people in the background. It, we all have gifts. Yes. We all have callings. We all have something in our life that God's stirring in our heart to do. And I ask you to get, get busy and get challenged and get out to it. Well, we're part of uh, Greentown Men's Breakfast, yes. uh, all of us guys here. And we just wanted to take a moment and share with you from our heart a topic that uh, most people don't like to talk about uh, because it's so controversial. People yes. think it's controversial. I don't think it's controversial. I think it's very plain uh, that God says that we're supposed to restrain from from anything that would cause someone else to stumble, uh, anything that would would bring somebody down or smaller. So, so we got together this broadcast, we got together this roundtable, and we're just thankful that you were part of it. You can look us up online, Greentown Men's Breakfast. Uh, get us on YouTube. Get us on the whatever else we're on, wherever you found us, and tell your friends about us that. Uh, that, hey, these guys are just a bunch of guys, average guys getting together and uh, uh, set around the table and, and, uh, and try to, uh, to bring light on what a Christian man is today. God bless you all. Yeah. <laughs>